If only I'd known then what I know now. There are so many things I'd have done differently. Now, how many times have you uttered those phrases to a close friend or confidant? After all, hindsight, they do say it's 2020, right? It's so easy to reflect and think on how we'd have done things differently if only we'd had the knowledge and experience at the time. An old manager of mine used to say that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again in the same way and expecting a different result. I'm sure the expression is attributed to Albert Einstein, but somehow I always end up thinking of Richard Lester when I say it. Do you ever notice how certain moments and expressions have really stuck with you over the years? Sometimes I feel like I'm right back in that moment again, 21, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, ready to take on corporate London in my new Primark suit. It's certainly a cliched way of looking at things, but it also does seem like a nice way of reconciling our grievances with our behavior in the past. We live, we make mistakes, we learn from them. We hope to grow in the process and not make those same mistakes again. I feel that making mistakes, experiencing things that don't always go as perfectly as we have imagined, is a great way of figuring out what we're good at, what we're less good at, and what we really need to focus our energies on. So tonight, I'd like to take you all along with me on a little journey down memory lane, a look at the lessons I've learned along the bumpy road of my life so far, because God knows it has not been plain sailing, and surely inspire a little hope through my experiences, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So for those who aren't so familiar with my story, hi, I'm Emily, I'm 31, and I suppose I would define myself as a content creator. I'm never really sure how to define what I do, but I have noticed that people always seem really keen to put you in a box and stick a label very firmly on that box just to make sure that the message is loud and clear. But more on that later. I've always been quite a happy person generally, raised in a loving home by my English mum and Maltese dad. In hindsight, I've always suffered from some unusual health problems, although I wasn't given any kind of diagnosis until much later in life. My family and I moved to Malta when I was just five, and up until then, I'd only ever been to Malta on holiday and to visit my nana Rita. So as you can imagine, the idea of being on a permanent Mediterranean vacay sounded very appealing to this excitable five-year-old. <laughs> Malta was a very different place back in 1995, but that's a story for another time. Let's just say that the traditional charm of the islands were in full effect. Malta was still really typically Mediterranean and arguably way less developed than it is now. I went to school and university in Malta, after which I packed up and moved back to my grassroots in London. It's interesting how the grass always seems greener, isn't it? To a five-year-old me, island living sounded so exciting, but at 21, I was craving a whole other experience. A bustling city life full of untold adventures. Add to that an exciting internship with a television production company, and well, you can imagine just how grown up I felt. Everything was going along fairly smoothly, and I found myself doing quite well in the field of recruitment. Definitely not what I'd expected to end up doing, but I was pretty good at it. And I really enjoyed the work hard, play hard mantra that pretty much echoed around the streets of the city as we piled out of our offices at 8 p.m. and hit the local bars for a debaucherous evening of boozing and flirting until it was all too late to catch the tube home. To be repeated ad infinitum, so long as your numbers were hit at work the next day. The glamorous central London offices and champagne bottles on colleagues' desks displayed as trophies didn't hurt either. Needless to say, that lifestyle and pace of life really wasn't one that was very sustainable for me. I started finding that I was really struggling with a lot of pain. Stiff, sore joints, 
constant headaches, upset stomachs, the list goes on. Initially, I just thought I needed a bit of a lifestyle change. My pain was dismissed by one doctor as me just being overweight and desk bound and needing a bit more exercise. I can't tell you how much that affected me. He just confirmed what I'd been conditioned to believe all along, that I was just fat and lazy and that the pain was just all my fault. So that soon shocked me into submission. I hired a trainer, I switched up my diet entirely, I even gave up coffee. I know, I know. Sure enough, I got into amazing shape really quickly. My skin was glowing, my eyes were bright. And guess what? I was still in agony. I tried to get by. After being dismissed by that doctor, the shame I had around the whole thing stopped me from seeking any more advice. But eventually, my, my pain became so great that I found myself completely unable to move independently. I was in such a state that I went to A&E several times until finally, a kind and considerate GP at my local surgery changed everything when he suggested that I could have arthritis. Arthritis? What? I was only 24. What do you mean? Isn't that what old people start moaning about when their knees get a bit creaky? Well, no, not exactly. This was an autoimmune disease, a chronic illness, and probably something that was never really ever just going to go away. And so began my journey. I was put on so many different medications. Everything we tried left me feeling nauseous, losing my hair, suffering from horrible migraines and vertigo. My full-time job became impossible. I was so frustrated and sick. I had to start bringing a walking stick with me to work and was sat away from my team in the downstairs portion of the office so that I had accessible toilets. I just felt like a complete outsider. I could tell that everyone was also really confused by my diagnosis, and you very quickly learn not to bat an eyelid at the annoying questions and comments. Oh, my granny has arthritis too, she's 96. Or, oh, have you tried omega-3s, or perhaps cutting out dairy or gluten? You know, those things should probably go on a list of things what not to say to somebody who's got a chronic illness. Eventually, I was let go from my job, which was a huge turning point for me as it really felt like the premature closing off of a chapter. Nonetheless, I found myself out of work and really at a bit of a loose end. So managing my illness became a full-time job for me, making sure all of my meds were stocked and taken on time, managing side effects, trying to keep up with the latest research on my condition, and if I'm being completely real, also spending an awful lot of time sobbing hot, angry, indignant tears into my pillow. Why did this have to be happening to me? I'm a good person. I don't deserve this. Where on earth was my life going? It took me a lot of soul searching to come to some kind of terms with my situation. I found things to keep myself busy, I joined a free philosophy course, I started swimming at my local health club when I could manage it, and working on building my stamina so that I could handle everyday life tasks just a little bit better in spite of my condition. I learned to be a bit more gentle with myself and also found myself looking to my past for answers, thinking of all of those times that my legs were aching, put down to growing pains, and I felt I couldn't really keep up with my peers in PE classes. All of the pieces started to add up, and I could really see how my own internalized fat phobia had stopped me from getting my diagnosis sooner. In hindsight, I know I should have put my foot down and not let fear of judgment stop me from getting the proper care. But as we said earlier, you live and learn. I just about felt that I was getting somewhere with my health when I finally settled on a medication that seemed to be working for me. Thank you, modern medicine. And just as I was starting to get back into my flow, that's when my mum fell ill. My darling mum, my bestie, my biggest supporter, always cheering me on and making the world feel safe and like home on the dreariest of days. 
Her cancer was diagnosed and discovered in the most dramatic of ways, with her being rushed to hospital unconscious, having her head shaved and going in for an emergency six-hour brain surgery. A, a trauma I'm not sure anything can really prepare you for, to be honest, and one I'm not sure I will ever truly recover from. After the initial shock discovery of her brain tumor, we were told that her cancer was sadly terminal and that she would have around six months to live. Now, this was a moment that would change the course of my life for certain. I felt the ground opening up under me and the walls of my world crumbling around me. As my mum lived in Malta and was given such a short amount of time left, I swiftly packed a suitcase and was back in my childhood bedroom to look after mum and be with her as much as possible. What I didn't know then was that her illness would actually go on to be a long, slow journey, one that required us to adjust to every phase as her health has deteriorated, and also to deal with all of the new challenges that have presented themselves along the way. It's definitely been a grueling illness, and I'm sure that many of you who've experienced cancer in a loved one can relate. A couple of years into caring for my mum, and the days were dreary. Cancer is exhausting, and I felt like I was aging in double time and that I was just missing out on so much life. I was itching for something new to pour my energies into, and I decided to finally just actually get started with an Instagram page, which is something that I'd been thinking about for years. I'd been following some really inspiring people online and finding some happiness in the uplifting stories that I came across. So, without really knowing what I was doing, I took some blurry mirror selfies. <laughs> copied some hashtags from some popular posts I'd seen on other creators' pages, and, well, that was it. My internet persona was born. I've since gone on to grow my brand and to make this my full-time gig, one that's given me so many interesting and fulfilling opportunities, like speaking at this event tonight. I mentioned earlier about putting people in boxes, and this is so true of social media as well. There's such a desire for us to narrow down what we do, but I've never really been a fan of pigeonholing personally, and I promised myself that I would only ever talk about things that were important to me without sugarcoating things, be it disability awareness, plus size fashion, grief, self-care, to restaurant reviews and lifestyle tips. One thing that my past has taught me is that being your most authentic self is a huge life hack that can really set you apart from others. As they say, there is only one you, and that is your power. I don't know if you ever really can come to terms with the diagnosis of a chronic illness or with the loss of a loved one, but I think that one of the secrets to living a happy life is to see each of these experiences as molding you into the best version of yourself. Learning to go with the flow and realizing that you can only control what you can control. And when you feel like the world is ending and it actually doesn't, well, that's when you know that you can get through anything. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs>